在我们博马才关注的热门投资赛道当中、啊，哈，医疗健康产业呢，绝对是能够排得进前三位的。事实上呢，人口老龄化、科技的进步，再加上各国政府的持续投入，以及呢行业比较相对高的一个利润，也是让医疗健康产业不仅呢是具备一个快速增长的潜力，也是进一步的巩固了其内在的抗周期特性。相信呢，也是成为了许多投资人在资产配置当中必不可少的一个组成部分。那今天呢，我们是要给大家介绍的公司。呢，就是这个行业里的一个领先者，他呢开发出了目前全球最小的无线起搏器，也是给无数的心脏疾病患者带来了福音。那这呢就是来自美国的医疗科技上市公司 e b r Systems。我们呢也是特别的邀请到了 e b r 的主席兼联合创始人 John McCutcheon 来一起深入的探讨 e b r 的技术优势和投资的前景，以及呢是医疗科技行业的一个发展趋势。I started, as you mentioned, over 30 years ago. It's probably closer to 35 years now. And when I graduated from college, I had an interest in business, but I also always liked science and medicine. So rather than becoming a doctor or an engineer, I pursued medicine through the, the business aspect.、Mm -hmm. I had a job early on with a division of Baxter Healthcare, which is a big medical device you know, corporation, and moved my way up through sales and marketing. And then I found that I was really interested in entrepreneurship,、mm -hmm. so I left Baxter and joined a small startup called DVI Devices for Vascular Intervention,、mm -hmm. and that was in the San Francisco Bay Area.、Uh, that's where I met Alan Will, who's now my chairman. We've been working together for、uh, gosh over 20, 30 years yeah, for quite a, a quite a long time. Yeah, and what you find is there we people that work well together. You find. Work over and over again.、Yes. So we've been together at many different companies. So I've been in cardiovascular space.、Uh, I also was a、um, uh, in pulmonary medicine. I did a company in orthopedics, and we sold that to Smith and Nephew.、Mm -hmm. And now I find myself back in the cardiovascular space, and、uh, specifically electrophysiology, which is a subset of cardiology.、Mm -hmm. I really enjoy the science, the medicine, and the business combined. First of all, as I mentioned, I knew Alan, and Alan Will was the chairman.、Uh, I had just sold my other company to Smith and Nephew,、mm -hmm. and Alan knew I was available, and so he called me, and we started discussing the opportunity.、Mm -hmm. I liked the space; I was really intrigued. I had not worked directly in electrophysiology before, and I thought, found that very intriguing.、Mm -hmm. uh, it was a big market opportunity.、Yeah. It looked challenging, which it seemed fun, like、yeah. it would be exciting to do. Uh, the company had been around for quite a long time. It was founded in 2003,、mm -hmm. so EBR is now 20 years old, and so some people would look at that as too big of a challenge. But、uh, I could see that the company had made significant progress. Was in the middle of the clinical trial, their pivotal trial.、Mm -hmm. uh, I have a lot of expertise in running clinical trials at my other companies,、mm -hmm. so I thought it was the perfect time to come in and、uh, get involved with EBR. Probably the most、uh, difficult and maybe rewarding、uh, memory was COVID. The came about. So I started in June of 2019,、mm -hmm. and my mission at the time was to get our trial enrollment completed so、mm -hmm. that we could move forward with with the、uh, PMA、yep. approval and FDA approval.、Mm -hmm. And then, as everybody knows, around、uh, I guess it was early 2020,、mm -hmm. uh, COVID started.、Uh, Kind of look showing up in the、yep. clinics, and in March of 2020, our clinical sites started canceling procedures. So we that month we had a record number of procedures booked, and we were going to have a record month. But then one by one they started canceling because they were closing down the clinics. So then at the end of March we were concerned: how are we ever going to start the study again?、Uh, nobody knew how long the crisis would be be with us. So we went to the FDA with our advisors and asked the FDA if we could reorganize the study、mm -hmm. to be more streamlined、mm -hmm. and be、uh, more easy to enroll in a, in a COVID environment.、Mm -hmm. And so they allowed us to do that. And the study that we finished enrollment this this past year、mm -hmm. was this modified study,、mm -hmm. much simpler,、mm -hmm. uh, better endpoints,、uh, fewer、uh, smaller sample size, and much easier to enroll. Uh, in the COVID era, 
Yeah, there's probably two main benefits to having the, the breakthrough des designation. Mm -hmm. One is the relationship with the FDA. They're a very busy organization and they have lots of applications and they're uh, probably understaffed. Yep. So, you know, so one company's application goes in and they're trying to figure out how to prioritize. Mm -hmm. When you have this designation, they put you to the front of the queue. So if, we're, if somebody else has something in there and then ours comes in, we get in front for that designation. Mm -hmm. They also are more amenable to having uh, uh, sort of informal discussions. So we can ask them questions along the way. Hey, we, we're unsure how you would want us to do this sort of a test. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And they're very interactive. So it increases the, the likelihood of a very smooth mm -hmm. approval process. And then the second big benefit is once we get approval in the U.S., then we get a extra payment or our device gets an extra payment. Mm -hmm. It's called a new technology add-on payment. And the breakthrough designation qualifies us for that add-on payment and that allows us to charge a higher price than we would have otherwise. Well, EBR is based in Silicon Valley, so I, I live in California. Uh, I've tried to come to Australia many times a year. Last year I was in Australia five times, so yeah. at least once a quarter. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to come face to face to meet our investors and, yeah. and uh, uh, tell our story, but also answer questions. This particular trip, uh, we were focused on more of the retail investors. We also have institutional investors. Mm -hmm. So we try to balance that back and forth, but we felt it's important to tell the story. We also have some, uh, some uh, case data from uh, a specific patient that we're going to share in Sydney. We have a, a, a gentleman that was treated several years ago, and he's a very charismatic figure. Uh, he was an ex-U.S. Marine, uh, had moved to Australia, relocated. Uh, he had a bad heartbeat, and they gave him a pacemaker, mm -hmm. and the pacemaker actually caused him to get uh, heart failure. He had uh, pacing-induced heart failure. He was fortunate that he was entered into our study. He got treated with WISE, and he's been just doing you know, really well. So we're gonna have him come meet with investors in our trip to Sydney next week. And uh, what was fun is when he came back for his follow-up, you asked earlier about how do we follow patients. He came back for, I think it was his two-year follow-up, and he had a new tattoo on his chest that said battery operated. <laughs> so that's how excited he is about having the technology, it's really changed his life. He was really uh, miserable and unhappy before because he couldn't do just the basic tasks of life. And now he's very vibrant and excited. So we want to share that story with our investors. Yeah. So there's three big sectors in pacemakers. One is for bradycardia. It's kind of the simple right heart pacing. There are ICDs, defibrillators for patients that might have a sudden cardiac arrest and they need to be, uh, be shocked back into rhythm. Mm -hmm. And then there's the CRT, the cardiac resynchronization therapy for heart failure. That's mm -hmm. what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the market was sort of mature and stagnant. It was growing for years. It's a huge market, but it had kind of stopped growing at the same pace in the last maybe 10, five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then more recently with leadless pacemakers, it's been reinvigorated. Mm -hmm. So we're part of that, although we're not commercial yet. There are other companies that have leadless pacemakers that have really changed the whole dynamic. Mm -hmm. Those pacemakers are for the right heart, right side yeah. pacing. Mm -hmm. And we're unique because we're the only leadless pacemaker for the left ventricle. Mm -hmm. So when we see the success of Medtronic's Micra, which mm -hmm. is the leading uh, right-sided leadless pacemaker, it really bodes well for us when we get on the market because it shows the value and the benefit yep. of leadless uh, technology. The real benefit is the size of, of our implant. So this is the receiver electro. This is the pacemaker that goes inside the left ventricle. And it's so tiny, it gets completely covered in tissue after about 30 days. Mm -hmm. And that's important because you don't want any clots to form. So if blood contacts a foreign surface, it'll generate clots. And from the left side of the heart, the circulation goes to the brain. And studies have shown if you put any materials, foreign bodies in the left ventricle, you have a higher risk of stroke. With ours, that doesn't occur because it gets covered in tissue. 
because it's so tiny, and then it's inert. There's no blood contact. And then the other thing is we can put it anywhere inside the left ventricle that's the best position for that particular patient. Every patient is different. Their conduction system, they have a, a conduction system defect that we're trying to overcome, and each one of those has the best spot, mm -hmm. and we're able to put it anywhere inside the heart to, mm -hmm. to treat that patient effectively. So the, the current Leelis market has been growing very rapidly, and this is again just the right-sided pacing. Medtronic announced that their Micra was at a $500 million a year run rate in revenue and they project it's going to be a two billion dollar market for them in the next six years or so. So it's again changing the whole dynamic. Our market opportunity we believe is about 2.5 billion dollars. That doesn't mean we'll get to that overnight. Mm -hmm. It'll take time to get there but that's the opportunity for us once we get on the market. What is really great too is we're not competitive with Medtronic or Boston or Abbott. Ours is unique and it's complementary. So when you're starting a new company like EBR, or a new technology, it's nice to not have direct competition with these huge multinational companies. We're complementary and we can come in and actually help solve a problem that they can't meet today. The primary endpoint of the study is a six month follow up. So we finished enrollment in June and now we're at the very end of the six month follow up window and then we'll start analyzing the data. We have a separate a st statistical group, mm -hmm. a CRO, that will do all that analysis. So they're start starting to work on that already. Mm -hmm. And our plan is to present the data at the Heart Rhythm Society meeting. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest US uh, society meeting in electrophysiology or in uh, cardiac rhythm management. And so that'll be in late May. It's gonna be in New, New Orleans mm -hmm. and we would uh, plan to announce all the data at the same time. The clinicians like to go and present the data at a scientific uh, forum mm -hmm. and then we'll also try to get it published at the same time. Uh, it's hard to do that, there's a lot of logistics, mm -hmm. but if we are good and lucky, we get both, we'll be able to present the data at the meeting and have a publication and announce it on the ASX all on the same day. That would be our goal. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that. So we have field people, so we have a, 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 a folks that are out in the field that are highly trained, skilled. They're not doctors, but they're technicians and they understand how to, uh, how to monitor the patients. And then we also work with the clinical group within our investigating sites. And so they'll schedule the patient to come back in at three months, six months, I believe uh, 12, 18, 24. We follow them for quite a while, mm -hmm. but the primary endpoint is at the six months. And the patient will come in and they'll go through a lot of tests mm -hmm. and we, we uh, gather all that data in our database. The primary outcome is uh, f uh, the volume of the heart. Mm -hmm. We want to shrink the volume of the heart so that it beats more efficiently and that's our primary endpoint. And that's measured by echosonography. So they take a, a sonographic wand mm -hmm. and they can measure the size of the heart mm -hmm. and that's done by a core lab. Uh, so that's our primary endpoint and uh, that's what's going through the analysis once we complete the follow-up. Well, we hope it's really good news and, and I think the, the data release is a really significant, probably the most significant milestone we face mm -hmm. because that's really the binary event. If we have a successful trial, which we expect, then everything else that follows is more execution, timing, and we'll follow that. Uh, the data is everything and so I think that's going to be a really big inflection point for us and something that our investors I hope are excited mm -hmm. to see. We're, we're really anxious to see that. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing. Fortunately we're in good shape. I mean we'd like to see our stock price higher for the, the sake of our investors. In terms of our cash position in our 4C, we announced we have 64.5 million US still on our balance sheet. Uh, we have a debt facility that we can draw on that we still have another 30 million available to us to draw. So we have cash to get through this FDA process. And so that puts us in a really good place. Mm -hmm. And that way, uh, hopefully our stock price will come up. 
uh, we'll be continuing to hit milestones and have successes. And then if we have to do another capital raise, it'll be with a strong you know, stock valuation, right? 